let's discuss some of the basic topics so that we can understand a little bit about thermodynamics and a little bit about heat transfer. In the first place, we have to understand what we mean when we say heat. So in this hot sauna, where is the heat? Well, I'm going to change your vocabulary a little bit. In the past, you would probably walk into a room and if the temperature was 110 degrees, you'd say, boy, it's hot in here or there's a lot of heat in here. That's not appropriate anymore. What we say instead is there's a high concentration of thermal energy in the room or there's a high temperature in the room. You see, we're going to define heat as the form of energy that is transferred between two systems or say a system and its surroundings because of a temperature difference. So heat is energy transferred because there's a temperature difference. So our sun transfers heat to the earth or you could say our star transfers heat to the earth because there is a temperature difference between the sun and the earth. The mechanism of that transfer is somewhat interesting and uh, I guess particularly interesting if you'd like life to continue on earth, which I do. So let's think about a sauna. If we insulate the sauna so that there's no energy flow from, say, inside the sauna to out, then there's no heat transfer, so we wouldn't say there's any heat here. This is a situation where we'd say that the sauna is the system and it is an adiabatic system, meaning that there is no heat transfer with the system and the surroundings. Now, on the other hand, if we take the system to be the little heater, that's what it's usually called, that's in the sauna that has the hot rocks on it, right, that are and that's not the right terminology, that has the high temperature rocks on it, say they're at 400 degrees, now there's nothing resisting heat, well there is something, but there's not much resisting heat transfer between the, the heater unit, so-called heater unit, and the air in the sauna, and in general the walls in the sauna. So there we could talk about heat transfer, and we could talk about the rate of heat transfer, something like energy per time would be the dimension, and kilowatts are one unit of power or energy per time. Now heat transfer is kind of like a murder mystery. I don't know if you guys lurk, like murder mysteries, but ever since I read Sherlock Holmes when I was a kid, you know, I, I love it. I just think it's, it's so fascinating. Of course there's so many um, impossible things and red herrings along the way and information you wish you had known and of course then in the real world things are a lot more fuzzy and noisy. The data is a lot more noisy, I would say, than in the murder mysteries, but they're still fun, you know. I don't like blood and guts and gore type of, of mysteries, but the ones where there's something clever, you know, uh, Perot or, no, actually Poirot, I think, or Agatha Christie, some of those more classic things, where there's something clever that's happened that the detective has to figure out. Anyway, all that aside, in heat transfer there actually are only three suspects, in other words three mechanisms causing heat transfer. Now if you have a heat transfer problem you know it's one of three things. It's either convection, conduction, or radiation. Those are the only ways that we'll talk about heat being transferred. They're the only ways I know about for heat to be transferred. Now fortunately if heat transfer is a problem for you, you only want one of two things. You either want to increase the rate of heat transfer or you want to decrease it. That's about it. All problems in heat transfer come down fundamentally to three mechanisms of heat transfer and only two things that you might want to do. And they're opposite things. Make it go faster, make it go slower. One of those two. And so if it's going too fast, one of these mechanisms or more are the root of the problem. They are the, the culprit, right? They're the guilty party that you as the detective are trying to locate. Uh, on the other hand, if heat transfer is not going at a high enough rate, well then you've got to increase it somehow. You've got to enhance one of these forms of heat transfer. Now, you probably know that if you were to stick a uh, hot item, like, like, I don't know, let's say you stick a, uh, a poker or something in the fire and you let it get really hot, you don't want to touch the end of the poker that was in the fire because you know that it'll burn your hand. That mechanism of heat transfer from the po uh, poker to your hand is called conduction. All right? It's simply conducted. It's because your hand is touching it. Right? It's in contact. There's material or I should say solids or liquids in contact with each other uh, or solid and liquid in contact and it's transferring heat uh, that way. So that's conduction. Convection, if you ever build a campfire, you know better than to put your hands above the campfire it's, if it's very large. You know that your hands will be burned very quickly. And the reason for that is not necessarily because there are flames there. I mean, you know not to put your hand in the flame, right? I, I hope. <laughs> but you don't put your hands above the flame either. Why? Well, it turns out that actually as the fire burns, there's a chemical reaction happening where a lot of thermal energy is released. A lot of the thermal energy ends up in the combustion gases. And those gases being 
uh, very high temperature are very low density and so they have a lot of buoyancy and they rise. Also there's a convective loop set up there but we won't talk about that yet. Anyway the point is they're really hot gases that are coming up off the fire and if you touch them they're so hot they would burn your hands. So that is heat transfer from the flames basically to your hands by a gas that has traveled from one place to another. So it is convection. Okay. So anytime you have a fluid typically that carries heat with it to or from, then that is a convective heat transfer. Now on the other hand, the smart way of course to warm your hands around a fire or around a wood stove is to sit to the side and just feel it. You can feel it as if it's shining on you. Well the reason is because it actually is shining on you. As a matter of fact, it's a form of light that you cannot see but you can feel because your hands absorb this this heat. That's the wrong way to say it, right? This Your hands uh, have energy transferred to them because the surface of your hands are at a different temperature than the surface of the wood stove and so heat is transferred uh, to your hands. So these are the three mechanisms and the only three mechanisms that we will consider uh, for heat transfer and a lot of times more than one heat transfer mechanism is causing heat transfer to occur. So it turns out that you actually are not very sensitive to temperature and you can prove the, this to yourself with a simple experiment which you may have tried before. If you have three bowls and you put a bowl of cold water on one side, a bowl of hot water on the other side and a bowl of medium temperature water in the center and you leave one hand in the hot, one in the cold for a while so they kind of you know, feel like it's normal and then you put both hands into the center bowl your brain knows that that center bowl is actually a medium temperature but the hand that was in the hot water will say oh this is cold and the hand that was in the cold water will say oh this is hot and you'll get different signals from your two hands suggesting that there are two different temperatures in the bowl when in fact there is only one the reason for that is that you're actually more sensitive to the rate of heat transfer than you are to temperatures and so this is where the idea that you could put a frog in a pan of water and very slowly turn up the heat and so the frog wouldn't really be sensitive to the temperature itself just the rate of heat transfer to their body now whether or not that actually works I don't know and I don't suggest you try it <laughs> There's no point in torturing a frog and killing it like that but the idea comes from the fact that you are sensitive to the rate of heat transfer you can prove this further by considering your home in the winter time and the summertime now one of the problems that we engineers have is we begin to learn things and we begin to measure things and we think we know everything about a topic and so you may have had this disagreement with your family friends whoever roommates whoever you live with because you may have learned, oh, well, this thing temperature is really important. And so you, you go through a winter time and you say, okay, it feels comfortable to have the thermostat set at, let's say, 76 degrees. And in the summertime at 76 degrees, the house feels too warm. And, and you can say, well, you know, it doesn't matter how we feel. The fact is the temperature is the same. And so we should be equally comfortable. And if we're not, it must just be in our minds. That's actually not the case. You see, again, you're really not sensitive to temperature. You're sensitive to the rate of heat transfer. In the winter time, you should measure the temperature of your walls and compare the temperature of your walls to the temperature of the walls in the summertime because in the summertime, the walls are much warmer and they're actually radiating heat to your body, whereas in the wintertime, they're not. They are, but not near as, as much. And you'll see why that is in just a moment. So there's actually more than one mechanism of heat transfer there. Your body is actually at a temperature above the 76 degrees, right? So you are losing heat to the surroundings. As a matter of fact, um, you're losing heat to the surroundings by convection because your body's at, you know, 98 whatever degrees and the room is at 76. So since you're at a higher temperature, there will be heat transfer from your body to the surrounding air. Okay, fine. But in the summertime, there's heat transfer to your body from the walls and from your, your, your body back to the walls as well. And that the balance there is a little bit higher. There's, there's not as much heat leaving your body because the walls are at a warmer temperature. Whereas in wintertime, your body leaves, le loses heat to uh, radiating to the walls uh, by comparison to the walls radiating to, radiating to you at a much higher rate. And so the room simply feels cooler. Now how you can use this information to your advantage is to realize that you don't necessarily need the temperature of the air to be all that high in order to be comfortable. In my home I've mentioned that I heat with a wood boiler. One of the things I want to add is a system that's actually fairly common in many 
cold European countries and that is something called radiant heating. You simply put pipes under the floor and you run hot water through it and you, the, the air temperature can be you know 65 degrees or so as long as it doesn't give you a cold but the entire floor can be set up to radiate heat to your body and so it feels nice and warm because there's this nice warm you know 80 degree floor transferring heat to your body it's a lot of surface area it's nice and warm it feels very comfortable uh, and you can actually save on your heating bills because your goal is not really to heat the room your goal is to heat you right uh, of course you know there's usually components and things your refrigerator and other items that you know electronics that need to be above a temperature of <laughs> say freezing or something but um, this is a trick that you can use to reduce your heating bill. Of course, you got to install the system. I'm fortunate my house has a basement. I've got access to the, the joist, so I intend to add that. And uh, you know, uh, there are some limitations. Uh, radiant heat transfer through carpets not particularly effective, so it wouldn't work in a carpeted house. But tile floors and you know even wood floors, uh, you could do this. Now, the problem with real wood floors is as you transfer more heat through them, you tend to dry out the wood, and so you can get significant gaps in the wood if you have a real wood floor and that's problematic. Engineered wood on the other hand may work fine. I'm not sure I don't have engineered wood in my home. So let's talk about an analogy so you can understand the difference between an amount of heat and a rate of heat flow. So we'll call the quantity of heat or you know the quantity of heat that is transferred, we'll call that Q. And we'll call the rate at which that heat flows Q dots. We'll put a dot over it to indicate how fast, how much energy per time is flowing out of something or into something. Okay, so let's start off with an analogy. If you imagine a, a vat of fluid that has some volume V, and we've got just a pipe coming out of it that's open, well then we could talk about the volume of fluid in the tank, and we could talk about the rate at which that volume is leaving the tank. And if we want to know how much volume leaves the tank, or the change in volume, we can simply integrate between two arbitrary times the volumetric flow rate to come up with the volume that has left. And I probably should have a delta in front of my V on that V equals integral T1 to T2, V dot DT. That would make it a little more correct. But just think of the whole amount of volume flowing out, and then we're fine. So th think with me. If the volumetric flow rate of water leaving a system or a tank is constant, and let's say that it's five gallons per minute and we let it flow for 10 minutes. Well, it's pretty easy to figure out the quantity of fluid that has left, right? Because five gallons per minute times 10 minutes, the minutes cancel, that's 50 gallons. Okay, the tank lost 50 gallons, no big deal. We can do the same thing with heat, okay? Now, it's not as if the system contains heat like the tank contains heat. It contains energy in other forms that are transferred and flow out as heat, okay? But the analogy will hold. So if we're interested in the quantity of heat that has been transferred, say, out of a system, all we have to do is add up the heat flow rate over time. Same thing that we did with the, the volumetric flow rate over time. So you can see the equation there that is completely analogous for heat uh, to the one for volumetric flow rate. So when the heat flow rate is constant, we can figure out how much energy leaves a system, let's say. So if we've got five BTUs per minute flowing out and it flows for 10 minutes, no big deal. That's 50 BTUs of energy that has less, left the system in the form of heat. Now, a lot of times it'll be convenient to talk about the amount of heat transfer on a per unit mass basis. So let me show you what I mean. We'll, we'll talk about heat quantity and heat flow rate again for a moment. Let's say that we uh, have a can of cold soda and we leave it out on the countertop. Okay, and it's nice and cold. It's at 5 degrees. If we leave it there long enough, it'll eventually come to room temperature about 25 degrees Celsius. Okay, now hopefully intuitively you realize that when the temperature of the can is really low, the rate of heat transfer into that can is going to be much higher. So let's say we've got 16 joules per second coming in when the can is at 5 degrees. The can finally comes up to let's say 15 degrees and then the heat transfer rate would cut about in half. It's, it would be very close to half. 8 joules per second. And when finally the can has reached room temperature, 25 degrees, then the heat transfer rate goes to zero. So to come up with the total amount of heat that has been transferred, we'd have to actually integrate that heat transfer rate over time because the heat transfer rate is actually changing continuously. Let's leave all that aside for a second, okay? Let's not worry about that. Let's just say that we somehow know that two kilojoules worth 
of thermal energy has been transferred into the can via heat transfer. Okay? Now in the can, let's say that there is about a third of a kilogram of soda. That's a reasonable amount for a can of soda. So 0.34 kilograms is the mass of the soda in the can. If we want to know how much energy is transferred to each kilogram, we can simply take the amount of heat transfer divided by the mass of the system, so 2 kilojoules divided by 0.34 kilograms, to say that it takes 5.88 kilojoules per kilogram in order to uh, warm the soda from uh, 5 degrees up to 25 degrees Celsius. Now, realize we don't have a whole kilogram here, but that's okay. We're just talking about how much energy would be required or, or would be transferred with this two kilojoules per kilogram if we had two, uh, I'm sorry, a whole kilogram, okay? Now let's talk in particular about the, um, the details of the various mechanisms of heat transfer. And the first one we'll look at is conduction. And when I was a kid, I was homeschooled, and so we took a lot of field trips so that we could, you know, kind of have social interaction with other people and kids and so forth. And I remember going to this, it seemed like we would always go to either a forest or some type of reenactment. So I really got a bad taste in my mouth for history. I'm just now in my 40s really interested in history, and I, I realize I've, I've missed a lot. I also learned a lot. Uh, but there's a lot to know about history. I mean, there's just so much that has happened. It's, it's difficult really to learn everything that's happened in the past and of course to really know how much of it is true how much of it really happened and uh, anyway so of course you go for reputable sources and things that are uh, multiple sources that you know confirm what's happened and so forth but anyway so I was this kid and we went to this uh, reenactment village I don't even remember where it was I want to say it was Spring Mill Park but maybe not anyway so they had this guy there that was working as if he was a blacksmith in the old days he had the bellows and the you know the the fire going and he had a piece of steel and the anvil and he was hammering this thing out and it couldn't have been more than a foot a foot and a half long just a flat piece of steel basically probably quarter of an inch thick or so one end of it was cherry red hot I mean you could tell it was really hot and the other end he had his bare hand on and I looked at that and even as a kid I realized intuitively there must be conductive heat transfer and wouldn't the other end right the end that's not glowing wouldn't it still be fairly warm and so I asked him you know when we had the chance to ask questions I raised my hand and I said well how are you able to hold that end of the steel because the other end's really hot and so it it must be hot right where you're holding it now to this day <laughs> I haven't done the calculations as to decide if he was uh, playing a joke on me as a you know a little kid or if really he was honest. I guess I should sit down and do the math. Maybe I'll make that an exam question for you. But anyway, I uh, I asked him. I said, "Isn't that end really hot?" And he said, "Ah, uh, you know, I do this all the time, and eventually the nerves in your hand just die and you don't feel it anymore." And I thought, "Oh my God, you know why? Why would you?" And that's what some people call fun, right? I didn't say that, but. Um, I, I don't think I'd want to kill nerves in my hands just to reenact what blacksmith used to, to do. But anyway, uh, it is obvious that there must be heat transfer down the length of that rod. Of course, there'd be heat transfer from the hot steel to the anvil as well, but let's not talk about that right now. Let's just think of the, the blacksmith there holding the piece of metal with the end of it a foot and a half or so away from his hand being red hot. How would we quantify the rate of heat transfer? Well, we use an equation called Fourier's uh, rate equation. You can see it there at the top. The rate of heat transfer, Q dot, for conduction, that's what the COND stands for, equals the thermal conductivity of the material, that's K, times the cross-sectional area available for heat flow multiplied by the temperature difference between the ends and the di and divided by the distance between the ends. So that's what the delta T and delta X are. Now, um, one thing about this, K, that thermal conductivity, is a property of materials. You should go in your book at this point. There's a nice little table of thermal conductivities in chapter three. You should look at them. You don't have to bookmark it. There's more data than that in the back. You may want to bookmark it, it's up to you. But there's a nice little table there. You should kind of compare it. You may be surprised at what has the highest thermal conductivity. 
So go look it up. I'll probably add that as a uh, lecture question. Anyway, so the cross-sectional area of flow, if we look at a bar, and let's say this bar is two foot long, we'll use the thermal conductivity K of something that's about steel's thermal conductivity. I think I even looked this up in the back of your book. 25 BTUs per hour per foot per ranking. And yes, all those units go with that one number. Let's say the temperature at the end where he's holding it is 150 degrees, which would be pretty hot. And the temperature at the end that he's forging or, or hitting with a hammer is 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, What would the rate of heat transfer be? Well, other information we need is that the cross-sectional area of flow is about a tenth of a square foot, and the length of this bar is two feet long. Now, understand, think about this like kind of a square pipe, okay? The more area there is, the faster the, the fluid can flow. But in this case, of course, it's not really fluid. It's just uh, heat transfer, right? It's thermal energy moving from one end of the bar to the other. Uh, it used to be that uh, the caloric theory, theory proposed that there was actually an invisible fluid that was transferred that moved heat around or that was essentially thermal energy. Uh, but, of course, that's not the case. That's been disproven. So if we now plug in all the numbers we have, the first number we need is the thermal, con thermal conductivity, 25 BTUs per hour per foot per ranking. The next number is cross-sectional area, the tenth of a square foot. After that, we need the difference in temperature between the two ends. Well, that's 1,000 minus 150, and the difference can be ranking, it can be degrees Fahrenheit, it won't matter because it is a temperature difference. So one thing you should note now about thermal conductivity is that temperature unit in the denominator is a temperature difference. Please write that down. Hopefully you took my advice, you found that table in Chapter 3, and just for the sake of your memory, make a note next to it that that temperature, just circle it. I don't remember if they've got both. Uh, English and metric units. It doesn't matter. Whatever the temperature unit is, it is a difference in temperature. It's not an absolute temperature and it's not a relative temperature. It is a temperature difference. So again, you can see why it wouldn't matter, right? Because 1000 minus 150 degrees Fahrenheit is the same as 1000 minus 150 Rankine. That's why I went ahead and put Rankine in there to again reinforce this point. Anyway, then we need to divide by delta x the length, the distance between those two temperature points. And understand one thing really important about this equation. I'm trying to help you understand it intuitively. Really, it's a differential equation. Don't worry about that right now. We're, to make it work, we're only looking at heat transfer in one direction along the length of the rod. So if your intuition at this point is kicking and screaming and say, well, isn't the air around it going to cool the bar down? Yes, but we're ignoring all that just so that we can focus on conduction. Okay. So anyway, the length of the bar is two feet. That's our delta x. Plug all that in. There's 1,062.5 BTUs per hour. Okay, great. You probably don't have a good feel for heat transfer rates. Um, there is an interesting heat, heat transfer rate we can talk about that might help you a little bit. If you go, I think it's the front inside cover of your book where all your conversion factors are. Maybe there are in the back. I'll mention this again later. But there's a conversion factor there that talks about tons of cooling or how do they put it? Well, basically, if you have an air conditioner in your house and it's rated at, say, a two-ton air conditioner, what does that mean? Well, that means that that air conditioner can cool down uh, two tons of water from the freezing point liquid to the freezing point solid ice in a 24-hour period. That's a heat transfer rate that can kind of make some sense to you because it relates to a device you probably have in your, your dwelling, uh, the air conditioner, and something you're familiar with, water, and kind of a scale because two tons of water is a, a decent amount of water. Now, it doesn't take up as much volume as you might think. Water is relatively dense, but it's still a decent amount of water. Now, how does that transfer to BTUs per hour? Well, it's 12,000 BTUs per hour. That rate of heat transfer, cooling down two tons of water, no, I'm sorry, one ton of water, from um, uh, the freezing point, but all liquid, to the freezing point, all solid, so 32 degrees the whole time, but the phase change, that is 12,000 BTUs per hour for, of course, 24 hours to represent the right amount of energy. Okay. So let's talk about convection next. That's one of our other mechanisms for heat transfer. Here we will use something called Newton's law of cooling. So you see the equation there at the top of the slide, Q dot convection equals H. Now H is a convective heat transfer coefficient. Where the heck do we get it from? Well, I've got a table on the left-hand side that shows it to you. It's not a material property. It's not like it's a property of air. 
it's a very complicated property of temperature, geometry, the, uh, the surface that's in contact with the solid, because if you think about convection, you're always talking about a fluid carrying away energy or dispersing energy in, in a fluid from a solid, okay? So um, it's a complicated thing. And there's a whole chapter in your, actually more than one, there's a couple of chapters in your book completely dedicated to how you would calculate the convective tr heat transfer coefficient. Turns out it's not a first principles thing. It's not like you can go to physics and, you know, here's the molecular arrangement of this and here's the molecular weight of the air so the convective heat transfer must be. It doesn't work that way. All of the convective heat transfer coefficients that I know of are simply derived from a lot of experiments. So if you have, say, pipes above, uh, well, just pi horizontal pipes, okay, with some type, say, air flowing around it. Well, then there would be a an equation, just a correlation, something that comes from a lot of experiments on a, a lot of different sizes of pipe and many different fluids, some liquids, some gases maybe, um, and, and you would have to go to that that correlation equation, put in the geometry of what you've got and the material properties of the, the solid, the pipes, and the fluid flowing around those pipes to come up with what's called the new salt number. It is a dimensionless number, but inside of the new salt number is the convective heat transfer coefficient, H, and you can solve for it. We're not going to do that in this class. That's a lot of work, okay? I, I suggest you keep this textbook because there is a ton of good information in it. It's not worth selling. It's so cheap. Uh, but the the chapters that have these, if you dive into them, they're very, very useful and, and very, uh, I wouldn't say convenient, but I guess I would just say useful. They're worth learning. Um, but it, we simply don't have time in this class. So I will always have to either give you the convective heat transfer coefficient or give you thing el every, everything else and ask you to solve for it. There are, though, some representative values, and I'm not trying to give you the magnitude of these values so that you understand it. I'm trying to compare these to each other. So if you think about gas with free convection, so that's our first row in the table off to the side, the con typical convective heat transfer coefficients are from 2 to 25. Now what do I mean by gas and free convection? Well I mean any gas, air, nitrogen, you know, whatever you might have that is the fluid either carrying away heat or transferring heat to. It could be the combustion gases coming out of your chimney, okay? That's a gas. Um, and the typical range of convective heat transfer coefficients that that gas will be able to take on will be from about 2 to 25 watts per square meter per Kelvin. Okay, now that's just a, something to give you a ballpark and a starting point. Now what do I mean by free convection? Well, free convection is where the gas moves not because you've got a fan on it or because you know, you're, you're moving it around or waving something in it or stirring it somehow. The gas moves simply because as it warms, that gas becomes more buoyant and rises in the gravity field, right? It becomes more buoyant, moves up, and that brings in colder gas to, to continue and, and set up what's called a convective loop. As a matter of fact, there's a link to some uh, a group of people called house doctors I would recommend you go look at. It's a very <laughs> beginning web uh, look so probably even before you were born this is kinda how most of the internet looked uh, but it's extremely valuable information. It's about a group of people that I believe back in the 80s or so started doing something called house doctoring. What they would do is they would go into homes and guarantee after they treated the house that you would save a certain percentage on your energy bill and mainly they would spend most of their time in the attic and what they would do is take out all the insulation seal every single hole they can find in the attic put down plastic to seal it insulate again put plastic over that essentially whatever is needed to just seal as much as possible in the attic because warm air is buoyant heat doesn't rise okay let's let's correct that now but warm air or warm gases are in fact buoyant and so they show many different interesting situations where convective loops are set up that they want to eliminate that end up causing a home to lose a lot of heat. If you imagine a wall in an old farmhouse that doesn't have any insulation on it, you can see it in cross section here. What will happen, let's say it's winter time, so it's cold outside, 28 degrees, maybe the air inside is 78 degrees, nice and toasty in the winter. And let's say the wall temperature is 68 degrees. Well, what will happen is since the inside wall temperature is at a higher temperature than the outside wall temperature, the air within the wall that has no resistance to, to moving around will actually rise on the wall side because it becomes warm 
uh, or warmed by the wall and so it becomes buoyant and moves up. When it gets to the top it has nowhere to go so it has to kind of move over toward the wall and this loop takes a little bit of time to set up but eventually it's set up and running nicely unfortunately but the warm air goes and touches the outside wall cools and falls and you got this this setup where the there's literally a loop and this actually enhances the heat transfer through the wall it's a bad thing you don't want this to happen you want to resist it so the reason we use uh, insulation you know uh, bat and glass fiber insulations is because we're trying to break that convective loop we're trying to get the gas to hold still see it turns out that the fiberglass that you put in your walls to insulate your home is actually not the insulator. It turns out that gases are really bad at thermal conductivity. They have very low thermal conductivities. But if they start moving around, then they can transfer a lot of heat by simply carrying it from one point to another. And so the purpose of the insulation bat is to hold the air still so the air doesn't move around. That's the whole point. And actually, it's the air that serves as the insulator in the wall. Anyway, um, so convection shouldn't occur in your walls, but there's not much you can do about convection occurring at the wall surface inside the home or outside. As a matter of fact, this is the reason why that when the wind is blowing outside in the wintertime, which that, you know, I can't complain this summer, I guess. It's been a fairly decent summer. But it seems like in the past that the wind never blew in the summer and always blew in the winter, which is exactly opposite of what I want, right? I want it to blow in the wintertime so I can cool off, but in the, I'm sorry, in the summertime so I can cool off. But in the wintertime, I don't want it to blow because what it does is it actually moves air past the outside of the house very quickly, keeping really cold air against the house and making the heat loss rate from the house higher, which means I have more fuel costs. Okay, my fuel is free. I get wood for free, which is kind of nice. But the the problem is I got to go load the boiler, right? So that's a lot more shoveling of wood into the boiler than I would like to than I would like to to do. Now, if you think about gas, let's jump down a couple of rows in this table. Gas under forced convection. Well, that's the wind blowing it. That would be considered forced convection. Okay, it's basically being pushed by the atmosphere. Or if I have a fan indoors moving air around, or a pump that is circulating a liquid, that is called forced convection. Okay, And in that case, if I've got forced convection in a gas, you can see that you can get about 10 times the rate of heat transfer because the convective heat transfer coefficient is about 10 times when it, what it is when you don't push the air around. So if you're trying to enhance heat transfer and you know it's in a gas and it's not transferring heat quickly enough, blow it around. You'll get about 10 times the heat transfer rate. On the other hand, if it's going too fast, uh, because there's something moving around, do something to keep it from moving so much, and you you can cut down the heat transfer rate by you know about an order of magnitude or so. Um, so, anyway, just some some interesting information. Now, liquids, uh, it turns out, have much higher convective heat transfer coefficients most times. So you see there in the liquid free convection, there's 50 to a thousand you know units uh, watts per square meter per kelvin. Whereas in forced convection, again, there's roughly uh, a uh, well it goes up to about a 20 times uh, factor so another order of magnitude basically so forcing convection not free convection not these convective loops but forcing convection gives you about an order of magnitude of heat transfer rate uh, uh, improvement or increase now it turns out that boiling and co condensing processes or condensation processes are even more effective at transferring heat. And this is the reason that in the old days, or well, some houses still have this, you might have seen a radiator, right? The old radiator that steam goes into, and then the radiator radiates out heat, and you hear the, the steam condensing and dropping down and so forth uh, inside of this, this device. And it seems very mysterious because you can't see what's going on in the inside. At least it did to me when I was a kid. Anyway, those units use steam because they are so effective or steam is so effective at transferring heat. When the steam comes in on the inside surface of those relatively cold steel or iron surfaces, it condenses very quickly and falls down. And so in that process, there's a very high rate of heat transfer because the convective heat transfer coefficient is so high. Uh, there was a, uh, when I worked at Grody, we were trying to laminate some things and we needed a, a lamination roller. So we ended up finding one that was actually relatively inexpensive. And we needed a lamination roller. It's just a, imagine a rod that's, you know, about, oh, probably, 
eight inches in diameter, and, you know, four feet long, something like that, made of steel. Not solid steel. It actually had holes drilled in it axially around the axis, and those holes were plugged because what they did is they, they connected all of these, these passageways inside of the roller with each other and put a fluid in there. I don't know if it was water, I don't know what it was, but it was something that could condense and boil basically at the temperatures we were working at. It may have been a refrigerator of some type. Of some type. And we needed a roller that across the entire length of it, which was the working length was about three foot or so, across that entire length would maintain a very consistent temperature. And so what this, this fluid inside of it did is if there was a cold spot because the roller had just given up energy to one of our parts that had moved under the, the roller, well then that would be a cold spot internally and gas would condense there warming that spot up very quickly because the convective heat transfer rate is so high in condensation processes. A very clever device, uh, actually relatively inexpensive and very reliable too. And we certainly measured the temperature across the entire face of it as we were running it and sure enough it was nice and uniform. Now it seemed like no matter what we did to it uh, until we broke it, uh, but that's a story for another time. Uh, <laughs> It seemed like it maintained a very uniform temperature, and it's because that inside of it there was some type of a refrigerant or something that could boil and condense, and thereby, if there was a hot spot, move heat away, or if there was a cold spot, bring heat to that spot very effectively. So anyway, if we have, uh, let, let's look at a sample calculation here. Uh, instead of looking at an entire wall's surface area, let's say that the wall surface area is A, and we want to calculate the heat transfer rate per unit area, in other words, per square foot. Okay, the temperature surface inside a wall is 68 degrees. The air temperature uh, is 78 degrees. Now, one note about the temperature of the fluid T sub F versus T sub S, the temperature of the surface. T sub F is also called the bulk temperature or T sub infinity. And what we mean by that is the temperature far enough away from the wall that it's not really affected by the wall. Okay, so it's the sort of the the, the temperature of most of the fluid that's not yet been impacted by the wall or transferred heat with the wall. Okay, so you'll hear me refer to this as T infinity, uh, TF, the temperature of the fluid, not very often, but also the bulk temperature. You'll hear me, hear me use that term quite a bit. Anyway, what we'll do is we will rearrange Newton's uh, law of cooling by putting the area on the left-hand side in the denominator. So now we'll have our heat transfer rate per area on the left-hand side. So the convective heat transfer coefficient I'm going to take for this is 17.6. That's pretty specific. Where did I get it? Well, don't worry about it. I would give you something like that. It's a reasonable number for this problem. And that's BTUs per hour per square foot per degree Fahrenheit. And again, one thing to note, in this convective heat transfer coefficient units, that denominator of temperature is a temperature difference. It is not a relative temperature. It is not an absolute temperature. Because look what it's multiplied by. It's multiplied by a difference in two temperatures, Ts minus T infinity, okay? Or the other way around, T infinity minus T uh, S. So, of course, I made the math easy. It comes out to 176 BTUs per hour per square foot. So every square foot has 176 BTUs of energy flowing through that square foot per hour. And guess where those 176 BTUs come from? They come out of your wallet if this is your home, right? Uh, you have to pay for this if you want to keep your house at 78 degrees. All right, there's a link in the slides. I suggest you go look at it. I think it's still active. It's something called green curtains. I'm a little skeptical that they work. Um, I'll let you go look at it and see what you think uh, if you have a moment. Now, convection and conduction are not the only two mechanisms of heat transfer. I mentioned our star transferring heat to the Earth. How does it do that? Well, if you've ever stood outside on a hot summer day, you know how. You feel a lot like how you feel standing next to a wood stove. This is, in fact, radiation. Now, you can say, oh, radiation, oh my goodness, radiation is horrible. Well, is it? It depends on the frequency of the radiation. You're actually bathed in radiation right now. The reason you can see me is because I'm being bathed in radiation called light. Now, there's a difference between radiation that causes damage to you and gives you, I don't know what, I guess cancer, uh, or, or just kills you outright, and light and things, uh, other emissions that we can't see. For example, radio stations are beaming out radiation all the time. They are at a lower frequency than the frequencies we can see in the visible range. There is also radiation coming from the sun that's at a higher frequency, the ultraviolet ranges, and there we're getting closer to things that damage. There are some 
ultraviolet rays that can of course cause uh, you know sun burning and, and skin cancer ultimately if you're exposed to it too much and even within the ultraviolet region there's several different classifications of UV light based on their frequency so when I say radiation I'm really just talking about electromagnetic radiation okay now when we're talking about heat transfer the band that transfers the most heat as far as we're concerned is the infrared band that's the part that we want to focus on technically all of it transfers some energy right and it's all heat because it's from a you know it's due to a temperature difference of the sun and the earth but we're focusing on the infrared portion because that's the part we're interested in now we have to define a couple of things here in order to work with radiated heat transfer but before we do that let's just look at the equation it's q dot emitted max what the heck is that well every bit of matter that is above a temperature of absolute zero will radiate energy in other words it will send out photons it will lose energy in the process but it will send out photons if the ad or the uh, electrons are excited in their excited state they'll move down to a lower energy level in the process they will uh, you know let go of a photon now it's also possible that the atom or molecule or whatever it is that matter will accept a photon and excite an electron into a higher state okay so what are we talking about with q dot emitted well we're quantifying the heat transfer rate from a body that is radiating, radiating out energy and it's equal to sigma which is actually a constant it's called the Stefan Boltzmann constant and you should uh, highlight this in your book look it up I recommend I don't I don't have this number memorized I recommend that you write this number down in your conversion factor so on the inside front or back cover wherever your conversion factors are but a is just the surface area area of the body and TS is the temperature of that surface to the fourth power now you need to make a notice a note of this that temperature has to be absolute units this is not a relative temperature it is not a temperature difference this is an absolute temperature and you have to plug it in that way you absolutely need Kelvin or Fahrenheit you'll probably not work this much in excuse me I said Fahrenheit I meant ranking uh, you'll probably not often work these problems in English units but if you do of course you'll need to convert some of the the units and you still need to use absolute temperatures so um, what do we mean here well what we're saying is that everything that's above a temperature of absolute zero glows so you know I guess <laughs> I guess the uh, whoever it is had it right we all have an aura about us or whatever but we're not talking about some glow that is due to your personality or your you know what kind of kind person you are we're talking about a literal transfer of energy where your body is giving off radiation literally um, right now because you're not at a temperature of absolute zero now a black body is a body that emits radiation perfectly and what I mean by a black body is a, a theoretical body there's there's no such thing but there are things that come very close to black body and and black body radiation a black body is a body that follows exactly this this equation that I've just shown you that the it it sends out the maximum amount of of heat for the temperature that it's at let me explain this hopefully I can give you a, an example from my life that will help you I'm a fairly cheap person I don't like spending money if I don't have to and I've told you about my boiler system well it sits out in my garage and the reason I put it in the garage is so I wouldn't have to go outside when there was snow on the ground to load the boiler right so I built it into the garage I was redoing the roof on the garage anyway so I ran the chimney up and out through the roof and you know sealed it and all of that so it doesn't leak and it's just a, a fairly simple steel chimney now the part that goes through the roof is triple wall so it's not gonna catch my house on fire or anything but the piping or the the stove pipe that goes from that chimney down to my my boiler system uh, to take the the exhaust gases out I cheaped out at first I bought some uh, stove pipe but it wasn't stove pipe it wasn't black stove pipe like you're supposed to use I went down to Lowe's and I bought galvanized pipe now some of you know <laughs> that that's not a good idea because as the temperature of the galvanized pipe goes off or goes up it can actually off gas or there's something that happens with the or that can happen especially if you get a chimney fire where the uh, the stuff that comes off due to the galvanization is really bad for you okay now I knew that at the time but I also knew I wasn't gonna be out in the garage with it much at all anyway so I was like you know what I just want to get this thing set up I'll, I know I'll replace this later and I have now I've got some nice double wall insulated pipe on it instead but at the time I didn't have and it was expensive I didn't feel like paying for it 
So, and, and I happen to have this galvanized laying around. I think I had to go get a few elbows or something. So I use that. And one of the things I needed to do, I really needed to monitor the boiler and how it was running because it can run wrong. And when it does, it generates a lot of smoke, which is wasted wood. I didn't want that to happen. I wanted some way to monitor it. And it turns out that you can measure the exhaust gas, gas temperatures because when it's not running properly, when it's not burning like it should, it'll gener generate a lot of smoke and that smoke will be relatively cold. So all you really need to do is measure the temperature of the exhaust gases. So what I did is I started off by drilling a little bitty hole in this single wall galvanized pipe and I put a thermocouple in there. And I knew that wasn't going to last because anytime it doesn't run right there's going to be smoke. The smoke's going to collect on the thermocouple which is just a temperature sensor. It's going to kind of block and insulate it and I won't get an accurate reading of the smoke temperature. And I thought, you know, I know this is not going to last forever. I know this thermocouple won't work forever. So what I'm going to do is also measure the outside temperature of that pipe. And so I got myself from Harbor Freight a little cheap infrared thermometer. It's just one of these, you know, I think I gave a whole $20 for it, something like that. And what it does is it actually senses infrared radiation and from that and some assumptions back calculates the temperature. It basically uses this equation in reverse. It measures the heat transfer rate that it's sensing, right? And then it back calculates the temperature. Now it turns out that real bodies do not emit radiation at as high a rate as you would expect given their temperature. As a matter of fact, a lot of metals, especially shiny things, emit heat at a rate that is much lower than what you would expect. So look over to the right side of the slide and you'll see that there's another term in there. It's called emissivity. Okay, There is a table on page uh, 88. It's table 3-2. You should mark, mark this page because that's where we're going to get so-called emissivities from so that we can correct the equation and get the actual heat transfer rate from real bodies or at least pretty close to it. So there's a parameter called emissivity. Turns out your skin, no matter what race you are, has about the same emissivity. Okay, and it turns out that galvanized metal has a very low emissivity. So the the rate at which that pipe was giving off heat was a lot lower, at least in the form of radiation, than would be expected given its surface temperature. That meant it was hot, but not shining very much. Okay, that's what that means. And so when I pointed my, my infrared thermometer at this galvanized pipe, I measured a temperature that was, you know, 40 degrees or so. And I thought, there's no way that's right. I know from my probe, the, the um, you know, the thermocouple in the pipe, I know that smoke is at about 400 degrees or the exhaust gases is 400, 500 degrees. This is a single wall of very thin metal. It's got to be at a higher temperature than that because this thing's been running for a while. And so, sure enough, I didn't bother touching it. I just put my, uh, you know, I, maybe I did. No, I know what I did. I threw some water on it. I maybe even spit on it or something. And sure enough, the water boiled. And so I knew that the surface temperature was very high, and my thermometer was not measuring temperature properly. The reason is that infrared thermometer, that little handgun thing, assumes a relatively high emissivity. Whereas the emissivity, you know, something like 95% or so, the emissivity of that galvanized was more like 10%, 0.1. Now, by the way, the emissivity varies between about 0 and 1, 1 being a perfect black body. Okay, so uh, real bodies do not emit radiation at as high a rate as you would think they would, theoretically, because they're not black bodies. And by the way, there's no such thing as a black body. Another kind of... Uh, humorous story along with this. When my daughter was born, I had this thermometer. And uh, the, the thing about the thermometer is it, it mainly senses, right? It's sensing heat transfer going to it. But so that you can tell where you're aiming it, it has a laser on it. And uh, there are baby thermometers you could buy that were about $50 at the time, or there was this thermometer I already had that was maybe $15, $20 from Harbor Freight that did the exact same thing. And so one day I needed to measure my daughter's temperature, so I grabbed this thermometer, pointed at my daughter's forehead, and pulled the trigger. And a nice red dot appeared on her forehead, and there were several people in my family who were a little concerned at that point. Uh, they didn't understand that that red dot wasn't the sights of a gun, I guess, or something. Uh, 
And actually all it was doing, it wasn't so much that it was sending something to my daughter, it was sensing heat transfer from her forehead. Now, okay, it was shining a laser on her, and that is a form of electromagnetic radiation, but it's just visible light, you can see. So I, I ended up losing that argument. We had to get a, a, a baby thermometer before it was all said and done, but it, it's the same thing. And, you know, sometimes you have to watch out for uh, uh, other people's knowledge not being quite the same as yours. Uh, or their, at least their uh, uh, perception <laughs> of what's going on. Anyway, uh, another interesting thing about a black body is that not only does it emit perfectly, it absorbs perfectly. So any radiation, no matter the frequency, falling on a black body is completely absorbed by that body. None of it, none of it is reflected. And so Q dot absorbed equals Q dot incident or shining on, you can say it that way. Real bodies actually absorb some of the um, incident radiation, but they reflect a portion of it as well. And so uh, there are many things that you can look at in infrared and they look reflective. They look like a mirror because they are reflecting so much infrared radiation. As a matter of fact, one of the demonstrations I usually perform, we have an infrared camera at the school. And what I'll do is I'll bring it out because it's neat to see everything in infrared. And I'll point it a few places. I'll, I'll point it at the students. They can kind of see each other with glasses. And when you have glasses, the glasses are a lot colder than your skin. And so there's kind of these dark areas and then this red around it. Turns out the nose is usually relatively cold. You can tell who's a mouth breather and who's a nose breather because as air moves through the nose, it, it cools this entire area. And it's noticeably different temperature in infrared. It's very easy to see. But then I'll say, okay, let's go ghost hunting, right? Let's, let, every paranormal show has to have an infrared camera, okay? So we'll point the infrared camera at the whiteboard that we use for writing on in the classroom. And when students look at it, they see a bunch of ghosts or a bunch of human forms. And it's like, what the heck is that? And then when you start waving, you realize it's actually simply a reflection of infrared. So the infrared energy shining from our bodies literally is bouncing off that whiteboard and coming back to the camera. And you can see your reflection in the board. I used that camera once in my home because I was curious where I was losing heat and I wanted to learn the, to use the camera anyway so I brought it home. I was looking around and I looked at one of my windows and I saw a ghost. Well obviously it wasn't actually a ghost, it was me. It was a reflection of me in the glass and I was actually really glad when I saw it. Okay, I admit I was a little shocked when I first saw it because no one else was home and I, I knew I shouldn't see a human form but you know there's this initial reaction of seeing a human form that surprises you. When you don't expect it and then I realize oh I know what that is that's just infrared reflection off of my windows that's actually a really good thing that tells me that the windows I have in my home are relatively high quality because what they're doing is they're reflecting infrared radiation you see one way that your home absorbs heat in the summertime is by light shining through the windows and not just light but infrared radiation and in the winter time if you don't have something to block that infrared radiation you also will get a lot of heat loss out of the glass if they're not blocked by infrared radiation. This is one of the reasons that people keep their windows closed with curtains in the wintertime because it blocks a significant amount of lost energy out in the wintertime. So uh, in seeing that I knew that there was some sort of film or coating or something on the windows that was helping to resist heat transfer through the window by radiation. Interestingly enough, uh, another frequency of light that you'd like to block is ultraviolet because ultraviolet light are the things that bleach out your carpet colors and your furniture and all that. So when I put skylights in my house, I made sure that it had two coatings, one for infrared and one for ultraviolet. So anyway, real bodies reflect some of the light that shines on them in the infrared range. And you, a lot of times we'll take this uh, absorptivity alpha to be equal to the emissivity. And that may or may not actually be the case. So that for a real body, the rate of heat uh, absorption by the real body is equal to uh, a percentage of, that's alpha or the uh, absorptivity, times the rate of uh, heat transfer incident on the surface. And of course the rate of, of reflected is the rest of it. It's one minus alpha times the rate of incident radiation. There's an example I want to share with you. I know I'm sharing a lot of stories this time, but I think it's helpful to understand it. Uh, an industrial example. Uh, I worked for Grody in Madison, Indiana for a year, and they make a lot of uh, products for tractor trailers. So a lot of little marker lamps and brake lamps, things like that. They injection mold a lot of their own stuff, and so they've got a 
the whole back area of the faculty or uh, of the factory when I was there was all injection molding. So they make lenses and all sorts of things. So if you've ever seen on the back of a car, like when it's sitting off the side of the road and it reflects light to you, that is there's a very special shape inside of it. And I can't remember what it's called, but it's like this square shape. And the way it works is it's like a corner. The light comes in, bounces off that two corners, really, or two sidewalls, and then back straight out at the, the direction that the light came from originally. The reason for this, of course, is if there's a disabled vehicle off to the side of the road, your headlights will, re will shine on the taillights of the, that vehicle and reflect light back to you so you don't hit it. You see it, you know, even if there's no power for the brake lights to be on on that vehicle. And so this is a safety thing. It's something that's required. Well, getting that inside corner just right when you're injection molding, the tolerances are really tight so that the light comes back the way it's supposed to and it actually reflects it all. So one of my fellow engineers was working on a problem where he, he needed to measure the temperature of these lenses as they came out because what you want to do is you want to cycle your molds as quickly as you can. You want to squirt plastic into the mold, open it up immediately if you can, get the, the piece out, close the mold and squirt more plastic in. You're trying to optimize the, the use of the machine and you know uh, use it effectively and cost efficiently. And so he was having a problem where <clears throat> he couldn't measure the temperature of the lenses directly because if he used any contact type of measurement, touching it with say a thermocouple or something, the plastic was still uh, malleable enough that it would mar the surface. Um, and so he needed uh, to use a non-contact method and so he decided to go with an infrared sensor. A lot like my handheld device that I mentioned but same sensing technology but hooked up to a PLC and a little more industrial and ruggedized. So he started, you know, he set this thing up and as the lenses come in, came out he started measuring temperatures and he was getting temperatures that were so high the plastic should have literally been on fire. And he thought, wait a second, the plastic's not on fire, there's no way it's that hot because number one it's not on fire, number two it's not just a melted puddle. So what the heck is going on? Well, it turned out it was wintertime. And in that area of the factory, the way that Grody heats it is by infrared radiation. Okay, so they've got all these pipes that run through the ceiling. Since the building is not well sealed, it's a good way to help the, warmers, the, the workers stay warm enough and the processes and equipment stay warm enough without having to heat all of the air, which would just be a ridiculous cost since it would just leak out of the building. They had to, you know, open doors and things all the time to move plastic in and out and parts in and out. It's just not practical to heat the air. So they have these systems of pipes and I don't know exactly how they work. I think the, the natural gas or, or propane, whatever it is, flows through those pipes and burns and makes these pipes that are, oh, probably three inches in diameter, makes them really hot. Well, on top of those pipes above it, and they run all through the ceiling, on top of those pipes there are these, these mirrors, okay? So imagine a cross-section of the pipe running lengthwise this way, and these mirrors basically, it's just sort of, I think, probably stainless steel surfaces running above it in sort of a tent fashion. And what that does is any infrared radiation coming off the top of this hot pipe is reflected back down so that all of this infrared radiation goes down and warms the workers in the process and so on. So at this point, maybe you can guess what temperature he was actually measuring. He was measuring the temperature of those pipes because what the reflectors were doing is exactly what they're designed to do. The, the, the infrared radiation coming from those pipes was being reflected off the ref reflector right into his sensor. And so once he realized that, he knew all he had to do was put you know, something to optically block the infrared radiation from the ceiling from getting down to his reflectors and then he could measure the actual temperature of the plastic that the plastic itself is giving off, right? So you gotta be careful when you're measuring temperature for, from a, uh, you know, using IR or infrared because you might be measuring a reflected uh, heat transfer, not just heat that's being given off by the body due to its temperature. All right, so um, finally we can talk about a simple radiation problem. If you realize that all matter above a temperature of absolute zero gives off infrared radiation, uh, then you should realize that in our little log cabin here, obviously the wood stove, if it's burning, is giving off significant radiation, but the walls are also above a temperature of absolute zero, and so they are giving infrared radiation back to the stove. Now the net flow is from the stove to the walls, right? It's a much higher rate from the stove because it's simply at a much higher temperature. 
but it's still true to say that the walls are also shining heat onto the stove okay if that makes any sense so if we want to find out the net rate of heat transfer from the stove then we have to take the difference between the rate of heat transfer from the stove and the re rate of heat transfer to the stove so you see we've got the emissivity of the stove we're assuming that's the same as the absorptivity Stefan Boltzmann constant the surface area of the so stove and the surface temperature of the stove to the fourth power which is going to be you know anywhere from three to five hundred degrees or so five hundred would be a pretty hot stove but three to four hundred degrees is fairly reasonable minus the temperature of the surroundings to the fourth power now obviously this is idealized there's going to be a variation in temperature around the walls but let's just assume some average temperature and go from there for the sake of argument here okay now understand both these temperatures the temperature of the surface of the stove and the temperature of the surroundings all have to be taken in absolute value this is not a temperature difference even though it looks like it because the temperatures have to be raised to the fourth power before the difference is taken